Hey all, this is Reddit Tusker. Recently, Dragon's Dogma 2 previews were released, and alongside those previews came a lot of developer interviews. Together, this made clear a lot of information that wasn't previously known. So in this video, I'm going to talk about some of the interesting stuff that I found while sifting through interviews and video impressions. First of all, min-maxing is confirmed to be gone. This is from a video by Ruricon. He did a hands-on preview, and this is what he had to say on the subject. Quote, it seems like every vocation has its preset stats and growths, so when you swap vocations, your stats are going to adjust accordingly, which means you can safely play whatever vocation you like without permanently changing your stats for your preferred build. End quote. This is a big departure from Dragon's Dogma 1. In the first game, your stat increase was determined by what vocation you were playing as at the time of the level up, which meant that if you wanted to min-max your magic attack, for example, you would have to get those levels while you're a sorcerer. Personally, I never liked this system in the original game, because it led to people playing a class that they usually didn't want to play with in order to play the class they did want to play with optimally. And even outside of a min-max perspective, it felt like you were being punished for experimenting, for changing your mind on what vocation you want to build, or for playing a different class to unlock augments. It seems in Dragon's Dogma 2, when you change vocations, your stats will simply reallocate, which I believe is a much preferable system. Alright, next is that there are indeed only 10 vocations. All the vocations that have been revealed are the ones we're going to have. I'm quoting Itsuno from a Eurogamer article. There's 10 vocations in the game, the 10 out there we've made public. So, that's that. But it comes as a surprise to me and many other players, because we were assuming that the color system was still in play. In the first game, each base vocation had a color that represented it and an advanced version of that color. They also had hybrids that were a mix of elements from two different vocations. Dragon's Dogma 2 appeared to still be using the same system, and so many people assumed that we would at the very least get an advanced archer and an advanced thief vocation. And when the trickster was announced, which seemed to be a hybrid vocation of two not announced vocations, there were people that thought that maybe a base form of those would also be announced, and maybe even an advanced form of those. After all, why would they add both pink and purple to the trickster if it wasn't a mix of anything? Since it seems to be an individual vocation unrelated to anything else, they could have added another single color, like they did to the Warfarer. This sadly also means that the Mystic Knight is confirmed to not be in the game, which I was still holding out some hope for. Interestingly though, the fighter seems to have at least some skills that the Mystic Knight used to. Looking at this image, you can see that the fighter has the enchanted counter skill. It reads, while using defend while enchanted, automatically counters with an elemental attack corresponding to the enchantment. From looking at the skills available in this demo for the fighter and all the classes, it seems likely that there are more that they haven't been able to unlock yet, based probably on their level. Which means it's possible and maybe even likely that the fighter gets access to other skills that would have normally gone to the Mystic Knight. It also means that pairing a mage main pawn with a fighter might be a particularly good idea since they benefit uniquely with this enchanted counter ability. Next, Itsuno in an interview also talks about the changes to the armor system. Let me quote from it directly. He's asked, are you able to talk about the changes to the armor system and the reasons behind them? It seems like it has been simplified. Is the under armor or clothing layer gone? Will it eventually be a transmog option and will players be able to do equipment presets? Itsuna responds, So for Dragon's Dogma 2, we changed the armor system and simplified it with the goal that people choose different things to have more visual variety. We wanted to balance it in a way so that people wouldn't end up always choosing the same things. In that regard, we added more variety and simplified the system. Rather than having an inner and outer, we divided the equipment for upper half of the body and lower half of the body. We added helms and capes. There are some presets, but overall, well, something that happened in the previous game at high levels was that people would go for the same kind of equipment in the end. This time we made a conscious goal of trying to create something that even at higher levels people would be encouraged to choose different things. So there will be some visual variety into what people are choosing. The interviewer then asks, So you mean everybody pretty much started using the same gear and looked the same in the previous game? Itsuna responds, Yeah, so because of that we tried to make it very consciously so that the higher your level, the more variety you would be encouraged to choose from. So this sounds like corporate speak to me. It doesn't make any sense that you would get more visual variety by reducing the number of options that players had available. There's nothing about removing the clothing layer that necessarily would encourage players to choose different things at higher levels. 
It doesn't make sense, and Itsuno here doesn't seem to make any attempt to make it make sense. He doesn't provide a real reason. To me, it sounds like trying to spin a negative into a positive by saying that this change helps visual variety and diversity in endgame gear between players in some nebulous and ill-defined way. Now, this next one's really interesting. Hideaki says that there are vocations exclusive to pawns that apparently the player can't be. There's some wiggle room to this not being true because the article that I found this on is in Korean, which means that the interview would have had to be conducted in Japanese, translated to Korean, and then translated again into English. So let me read you the question and what Hideaki responds. This is the translation made by someone on Reddit. Why are some vocations exclusive to the players? Is it a technical issue or a balance issue? Itsuno responds to that inquiry. In case of player-exclusive vocations, they will be hard to master. We designed them to have the capability of two pawns in a single character. In contrast, there are pawn-exclusive vocations, so you might have fun to build your own party with them. Now, just in case, I put the original Korean into a translator website, but it appears that it's not a mistake. The interviewer asks why there are player-exclusive vocations, and while talking about the player-exclusive vocations, he also mentions that, on the other hand, there are pawn-only classes. Given the context of the question, I'm going to assume that this is probably accurate, at least for now. Moving on in the same Korean interview, the interviewer asks about the dragon's plague that affects only pawns, and that if you contract it, a disaster will happen. Is this calamity big enough to affect the ending? Itsuna responds, in the case of the Dragon's Plague, as you said, the setting is that a great disaster will occur when the outbreak occurs. But what that disaster is, is a currently a secret. Although the probability of an outbreak is low, the disaster that occurs is really, really big. If an outbreak occurs, the internet will likely be in an uproar. So what they're referring to is this Dragon Plague that they've talked about before. On the website, it says, Dragon's Plague is a contagious, disease-like condition that infects pawns as they travel between worlds. Rather than being weakened, pawns with the disease are said to display remarkable performance and to become conspicuously bold in their speech and behavior. According to folklore, when the symptoms of Dragon's Plague reach a terminal stage, it will result in devastating calamity, but the veracity of those claims is unclear. So, it looks like Dragon's Plague is a disease that you can get from other pawns as you get them from the internet. So if you hire pawns that have Dragon's Plague, they might infect your pawns with Dragon's Plague. Itsuno says that the chances of an outbreak are low, but if it happens, it's got a big effect and the internet will be in an uproar. Since it's a secret, there's not really any knowing what this means. It's possible that this outbreak is something that happens specifically in your world, or because the pawns spread the disease through the internet, it's possible that an outbreak happens when some percentage of the player base has main pawns that have contracted the disease. Whatever it ends up being, Itsuno insists that it's going to be a big deal. So the secrecy is pretty exciting. Anyway, that's the end of this video. As always, thank you very much for watching.